Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. This next episode, I'll be interviewing the owner of Box Real Estate, Bob Boxler. Now, Bob and I actually grew up in the same town, a small German community called Mount Angel, Oregon. We were in a farming community, a lot of agriculture, and it was very un- not it was not very uncommon for for us kids to really grow up on the field doing agriculture. In fact, I grew up picking berries and pulling plants and, and did a summer of belling hay before I actually started my career in healthcare at the age of 15 in Portland, Oregon. Now, this episode, what we discuss is the value of time and why it's important to utilize your time wisely, but more important, why you should be taking and focusing on a career and not a job. Now, in my definition, what is a job? A job is simply something that's going to pay you to do something, right? A career is something that you love to do and you get paid doing it. That's the difference. This conversation with Bob actually reminds me of a conversation I had with one of my mentors. And during that conversation, a couple of years back, when I started a new position at my organization, I had a conversation and said, you know, here's my career growth path and my goals. My goal is I want this title by this age. And, and my mentor kind of looks at me and is like, okay, well, What is it that you want to do? Because I know a lot of people that have the title and have the money. They sit on the boards, right? They're in the community, but they're really not happy because it's a job. They're not doing what they love to do. And when you do something that you truly do not love to do, you get burnt out pretty quick, right? It becomes very difficult to continue to move forward when you're constantly feeling you're waking up doing something you do not love to do, right? It's like you're running in mud, Right. And so taking this to heart for my mentor and and really focusing on that. Now, what I begin to think about when I think of career goals is what do I want to do and how is that going to make me feel? Because at the end of the day, I want to do meaningful work. Right. I want to make a difference in people's lives. That's why I'm in healthcare. So throughout this episode, I would encourage you, the listeners, to think, what is it that you truly want to do? What do you love about life? And how can you make that into a profitable, profitable income-driven job or career? Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. civil engineering major from Oregon State University. He has traveled the West constructing and designing bridges up until 2017 when he left to pursue real estate. Please welcome the owner of Box Real Estate, Bob Boxler. All right, Bob Boxler, thank you so much for joining me today on the Shades of Entrepreneurship. I'm actually really excited about this. Uh, so let's let's hear a little bit about who Bob Boxler is from Box Real Estate. Tell us, tell us who is Bob? Well, Gabe, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, I know straight off the, straight out of the gate, everyone should know we grew up in the same. It's it's very true. Small, (laughs) very small, very small talking 40 some odd people graduating with a small. Everyone knows everyone. (laughs) There's one flashing yellow light in the middle of town surrounded by fields, Mm -hmm. farming community, right? And that's where it all began. So yeah. grew up, I, I think I had a very great childhood, two great parents. We had our challenges. They lived pretty modestly. We're, we're probably middle class, right? Mm-hmm. Like most of Mount Angel, there's a lot of blue collar too. And we got a taste of that. And I think that's a big key that I want to, uh, that I reflect on a lot yeah. is mom and dad, they were, they had four kids really mm-hmm. early on. So money wasn't f- mm-hmm you know, falling out of their purse or their wallet. Right. And 
if we wanted something, they made us pay for it ourselves. So that mean we that meant we had to get a paper route. Mom would take us to the fields. Did you ever? Mm. Oh yeah. Cut oh broccoli? yeah. Oh I, yeah. Broccoli is my favorite thing. I actually didn't cut broccoli. You know, I stopped when uh, berries because when I turned fifteen, that's when I started up at OHSU. So you know, yeah. OHSU got me pretty young. Yeah, berries, picking strawberries, moving irrigation pipe. But mm. I fall back when I want to paint the picture to people. Cutting broccoli, in my opinion, there's worse jobs, but cutting broccoli is pretty high up there on the list of the worst yeah. jobs you can do. The tractor goes half a mile an hour. You're bent over with yep. a little dull knife cutting and you cut your hand five times each day. Yeah. And the the plants are soaking wet in the middle of summer. So it's 90 degrees and you're going half a mile an hour yep. all day long. So we had to do that as kids and our parents I think purposely made us. Do that. Oh yeah. I think so too. <laughs> and that really forces you to look at like, do I really want to buy these shoes? Because yeah. I just spent a day to earn this mm-hmm. 50 bucks, mm-hmm. uh, you know, busting your ass out there. And Definitely. It, it changed. It, it really molded our mind. And I, and we'll touch on this more later, but money and wh- how we think about money is big in our upbringing. And that has stuck with me. So we grew up there. Mom and dad did a great job of teaching us, the four kids, Mm -hmm. how to, you know, work hard, respect your elders Mm -hmm. and do good at school, you know, go play sports. Uh, we, I excelled just naturally at taking tests. I didn't try at, I didn't really try, uh, extremely hard to study every night and do homework, but it kind of just going with the flow was good at it. Mm -hmm. I can figure out how to find the right answers. And that kind of, I call the growing up kind of going with the flow portion of my life. I went to school, Mm -hmm. played sports, graduated with great honors, applied to one college because dad went there. Mm. Dad helped foster my uh, fondness for math and physics and science. Mm. Not so much Mm. science, math and physics. Like, let me just work this equation and I can find the right answer. I hated math. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I hated math. Yeah, it's a you either love it or you hate it. Yeah. And so I I just made sense to me in physics. What yeah. do you think about physics? You know what? It's kind of funny. I actually enjoyed physics. Okay. I hated math. I enjoyed physics. Physics is cool because it makes sense. Right? Yeah. If I yeah. push here. Yeah. No. Totally. It's you get to the you get to the bottom of it. Like I want to get to the core answer. Yeah. That's it, physics. It's applicable to anything you look mm-hmm. at. I drove over five bridges on the way here. I'm sure, or more than that, and. Physics and engineering and math are all part of all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, gra- I I followed in dad's footsteps. Dad was a mechanical engineer. Mm-hmm. He kind of quizzed me on math facts because I was good at it and mm-hmm. we liked that. And just kind of nice. going with the flow in quotation marks. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going with the flow through life. Apply to one school because dad went there and it's right. the engineering school. That's Oregon State. Mm-hmm. Graduated in four years because, again, I'm decent at test taking. Not the best study. Man, I was horrible at tests. <laughs> Dude, I had a system. I just cram for the week before and mm. pass the test, but no, like no homework be- between then, unless it wow. was, unless it was, uh, yeah, my classmates hated me, but we, we worked together <laughs> at the library to make up for that. But, um, just kind of putting in the time. Cause I wasn't really right. at, at the end of the four years, I was like, man, I am done with this. Even though it's fun to party four nights a week yeah. or yeah. more, Told, yeah. I was just like, I, this is a lot of time that I'm just kind of wasting here. So I'm ready to be done Mm -hmm. at that moment. And still under the context of going with the flow of life. I, during that time at school at Oregon state took one internship. Actually, they lured me in just because one night working late at a computer lab, there's a free burrito downstairs. Oh, you got And I'm like, (laughs) what are we doing for dinner to my friend? And he's like, I don't know. There's burritos downstairs. You want to go? I'm like, sure. So we go downstairs We sit in their little presentation and it's Mm. a Kiwit. It's a big construction company. And we, we watch their presentation. We eat their burritos and they're like, Hey, do you guys want to sign up for an internship? Like, what are you doing this summer? And we're like, I'm like, sure, let's sign up and, and interview me. Right. Yeah. I find out later Kiwit's like, they, they crack the whip on you. Uh. You you put your head down and work there. (laughs) I go take that inter- internship, right? I go to Seattle, live there for a summer, mm-hmm. working on a big, big project, like hundreds of millions of dollar building uh, up there for a summer. And at the end of that summer, this is junior year summer, going okay. into senior year, they offer me a job. Okay. And this is, I'm going to graduate in 2009. So I have a, you know, great salary job lined up for my whole senior year. So yeah. I'm just like ready to go again. 
kind of just fell in, into place. Yeah, I didn't yeah. seek them out. I didn't decide I want to work for that company and go build uh, build bridges. But when they showed me that presentation, I was like, that's pretty cool. I can yeah. go build bridges. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. Graduate. <clears throat> four years. Graduate. Go take that job. Uh, sp- get to spend four, four to five years. Uh, they moved me to Vancouver, British Columbia. Worked oh, wow. on billion dollar project up there going on and get to work on like the coolest centerpiece bridge of that project for four over four years of my life Mm -hmm. and got a you know again there i uh, that upbringing kind of chimed in i work hard put my head down yeah um do whatever my boss asked me to do right and and in my mind at that time i'm like ah that's my job right i want to I want to create freedom and retire someday and go do, you know, traveling and do what I want to do. But the way to get there grilled into me from the very beginning has been show up every day, work hard, Mm -hmm. treat people with respect, which is a great rule to live by Mm -hmm. and take care of your boss and they'll take care of you. Right. Get Mm -hmm. promotions, work your way up the ladder. And so there I am living that dream out that I kind of went in the flow with the flow to, to fall into. So I did that. I worked on that project. Awesome project still there. Awesome to look at the pictures, drive over it. It's an incredible experience to be part of something like that. And stayed with that career for seven, almost eight years, the engineering uh, construction management. And then later in that journey was design of those kinds of things. And got to live in Vancouver, BC, got to live in Portland, got to live in Hawaii, oh, Oahu. Wow. Yeah. Had that time in Seattle. So got to see some different places. Yeah, just kind of the West. Yeah. yeah. And um, so the first five years of that, it's really exciting. Like right out of school, the first time you get your job, you're like, this is awesome. We're going to change the world. I'm going to work my way up the ladder. And then, and and that all happened. Like my bosses loved me, uh, got promotions and I was far from the best engineer, but likability goes a long way. Yeah. That's very true. Right. Very true. In any company you go to work for. It's very true. People want to keep people they like to be around, around. So as, as crappy as that sounds, just being likable is a big part of the equation. Yeah. So I knew I wasn't the best engineer, but here I am getting put on really cool parts of the job, really challenging projects, mm-hmm. arguably the coolest projects we had at the time. And I, and I saw this all happening and I, and I just registered with me and, mm-hmm. and, and held that understood it. So, but along the way, like this job is hard. Mm-hmm. We're fresh out of college. They give you huge budgets. They give you huge deadlines. They give you a crew to manage. I'm talking at, Three years out of college, I'm managing 20 iron workers on oh, a bridge. Wow. The tower is 500 feet tall. And if somebody holds the button too long, somebody could die. Like we're pulling on cables and doing right. all this crazy wow. construction. And that's a lot of stress. Yeah, I imagine so. <laughs> There's deadlines to manage. Oof. People could get hurt. Yeah. And it starts wearing you out, right? Yeah. Office politics. Mm. Uh, not, you know, every year raises come around and you get. I hope I get my 3% raise. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and oftentimes parts of the job, the schedule is so critical on that bridge, that first one in Vancouver, BC, if we were late one day on the project, and this is like a five, six year project, mm-hmm. the liquidated damages for one day late on that project was $300,000 per day. <laughs> and everybody on the job knows it. Wow. So if you're anywhere near the critical operation, you know, every manager is watching you and that's a lot of pressure for yeah. young people. Yeah, I imagine. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're supposed to not let anyone get a splinter, right? So nobody gets hurt, which right, right. nobody should get hurt at right. their job. But it's just a lot of pressure. And I would talk to my dad about this and I'd be like, dad, this is insane. I feel so stressed out. Somebody's going to get hurt because I'm spread thin. And he kind of, I would be talking on the phone with him because he's down here working in Portland. Yeah. Yeah. And he would kind of just sigh and say, you know, sometimes it's just like that. And that sticks with me. Dad was in the design world mm. where you just go to the office, do math and design a yeah. ventilation systems and another t- side of engineering. Well, also from a different era. Yeah. Engineering. Right. Yeah. He, he was, he did that for 25 years mm-hmm. or more. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a mechanical engineer. So a diff- little different discipline, mm. uh, but we're doing the same thing. Like looking at a problem, he, he would figure out the HVAC systems and, Right. Uh, make sure air flows, right? So people mm. don't suffocate in a big, mm-hmm. big building or whatever structure you're working with. But he, that was interesting to look back on later because he was in a completely different kind of engineering than I was, but he's in the same, he's in a job at a company and he's, he's 
saying to me over the phone without saying it, that he's feeling. And, and we saw it when we were kids, we'd see mom and dad argue about things. And there was times when we knew dad wasn't super excited to go to work. Mm, right. Mm, mm. He was stressed out. Yeah. He didn't feel like he was being valued. Yep. He wasn't getting the, the uh, accolades for all the effort he put in versus somebody else. Right. And we knew as young kids that dad actually really, really, really would have loved to quit engineering and go be a teacher. Mm. Oh, okay. Which seemed like just the way it was like the, the reason he never did that. So I thought was they don't pay a teacher, right? A starting right. teacher, the same salary they pay a 25 year engineer, which, Hey, let's take a moment. They should. Those, those teachers out there, thank you for what you're doing, especially during this pandemic. I know it's been difficult for those parents out there. Yep. I know it has also been difficult for you. Those students, I know it's been extremely difficult for you as well. Mm-hmm. Listen, we're all in this together. Thank you, teachers, for all you're doing. Uh, thank you, parents, for, for you know being patient with them <laughs> and, and, and patience with the students, man. Oh, man. People shaping young people's lives. Yeah. That's super valuable to any. Yeah civilization, like as a whole, we need good teachers, good mentors, mm-hmm. good. And he wanted to be part of that, right? Yeah. He wanted to be a voice helping shape future generations mm-hmm. and sharing what he learned in life, but he never took that leap. And so, uh, fast forward a bit, the, um, I'm going through this phase of life, seven, eight years yeah. in engineering. And over that course of that time, I'm doing well, I'm exceeding at my career. All that stress we talked about is there. The, right. I'm feeling it. I'm also hearing this from dad who's been doing this for 25 years. And I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. In that hustle, I, I get in a relationship with a Canadian at the time when I lived up in Canada and we ended up rushing into a marriage. Mm. So that happened and we were struggling through that. We, we had rud- we had rushed into it. So we were conflicting. We we're trying to figure that out. And I get moved to Hawaii and she moves there with me. And we're, we're brand new, this, this marriage kind of relationship. And it's, it's hard you yeah. know, living with somebody for the first time and having rushed into a, a situation like that. But we're trying to figure out we're young. We think we can take on the yeah. world, Yeah, but it's really hard. We're yeah. trying to, we're trying to have conversations. <laughs> we're trying not to, you know, uh, push each other, you know, too hard. Definitely. definitely. And, and while the day jobs are going on mm. and while all that mess is happening, uh, I get a I get a uh, call one day from Oregon. Mm-hmm. I'm out in Oahu, Hawaii, working on this important job, right? Right. And I, and these jobs were important to me. Every right. job's important to me. Yeah. Whatever we're doing, you should you should really care about it. And yeah. for a long time of my journey, I was all in on these projects, right? Mm-hmm. And you have to be because yeah. you need to be there. You need to be aware. You need to be present. But I get a call and it's like, hey, uh, from my mom. Hey, Dad, he's he seems a little sick. He got. He, t- he woke up the other day. He's, he's kind of yellow. He looks a little, his skin color looks off. So mm. we're going to go get him checked out. And they did. And it turns out he had cancer of the bile duct. Mm. And I don't know, you probably know more about it than I do, but the bile duct is somewhere super hard to get to. Yeah. And it also sends, you know, yep. whatever all throughout the body. So if it gets malignant or spreads, it could spread quickly. Yeah. So I get this message and I'm like, okay, and I'm a, I'm an optimist, right? right? I think an optimistic mindset of, Hey, there's problems, but we can figure it out. Or, mm-hmm. uh, just if I keep doing the right things, the right outcomes will come that same thing happened here. I heard this and I was like, Oh, dad's a strong guy. Dad's yeah, a, yeah. he's 49 years old. He's gonna, mm, be, he's gonna figure yeah, this out. Yeah. And yeah. so meanwhile, I justified being like, they'll figure it out and I'm going to keep working and I'm going to keep an ear to it. But I right. never even looked up that kind of cancer. I never even stopped to Google it. Right. Gotcha. I just kept going. Cause I, was, I had a lot of shit going on. I yeah, was yeah. arguing with my wife at the time, yeah. trying to figure that out, trying to help us succeed at that journey, yeah. trying to work my job, which I was on night shift on the time, building a bridge over a freeway. Mm. It was insane. And that happens that gets thrown in the mix. And so I, I'm like, okay, I'll keep me posted. Let me know if I need yeah, to come home, yeah, but yeah. I'm doing my job. So a few months go by and, and with where that's located, they're like, we need to get you into surgery ASAP and yeah. get it taken care of. Yeah. So they do, they sign him up. And within three months, he goes into surgery, gets it removed or the best they can. Right. They stitch him back up. He goes home. I call him on the phone a couple of times. He's home. He's really uncomfortable. Mm. And he, and, but he's like, yeah, I'm home. It, it really hurts, but 
you know, it seems like it went okay. And I'm like, all right, cool. Good to talk with you, dad. Yeah. Um, so I go back to work and one day I'll never, never forget the day, but I'm out in Hawaii and starting the crew up. It's like yeah. seven thirty eight in the morning. Right. Mm-hmm. And it rained the night before. And if you've ever lived in the tropical climate, when it rains the night before and then the sun comes up in the morning, it's like a sauna out there. So I'm actually mm. at the store getting bags of ice to go put in the coolers so the crews don't overheat because it's going to get hot that day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my phone rings and it's my brother. You know my brother. Oh, yeah. He doesn't call me at 8 a.m. all the time, but I answer. It's 8 a.m. in Hawaii, so it's later here. He's like, hey, um, I don't know what's going on, but dad went back to the hospital last night. And I said, what's going on? He's like, I don't really know. We're, we're heading up there. The doctors say it's okay. They're monitoring him, mm. but, uh, but he's back and something wasn't right last night. And I'm like, okay, do I need to come back? And he's like, no, I think it's going to be fine. We'll, we'll let you know what they say. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, okay. So I grab my ice. I go back to the job, fill up the coolers. A few hours go by and I get another call and it's my grandma. I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that's weird. And so now it's like middle of the morning. Yeah. And I'm on, I'm literally standing on this bridge that we're building with my boss right here and my uh, superintendent there and I answer the phone. It's grandma and grandma's seen some shit, right? Yeah. Grandma's <laughs> our, our elders, they've, they've lived a lot of life. Yes, they've yes, lived they more have. life than we've yes. even been alive. And, and I'm like, this is weird now. Two calls in one morning. Yeah. Grandma calls and she says, Bob, I'm here at the hospital and you need to come home right now. Like you need to get on a plane. Really? Because I've seen, life and I've seen mm. death and this is not a good Man. situation. Grandma knew. And grandma knew in like, I'm sure within like an hour of being there. And meanwhile, all of us are like Mr. Mrs. Positives, like, Oh, he's going to figure it out. There's right. fine. Right. Grandma took one look and calls me and says, get your ass here. Yeah. And so I just broke down at that moment. Yeah. I was on the job and I'm like, guys, I got to leave. Yeah. And so I drive home, barely get there. Uh, we book the next flight off the Island get here. But by the time I get back to Portland and get to the hospital, he's already unconscious, like being supported by machines, man. Yeah. And, uh, and then you just, we just had to wait till it was, there was, he wasn't going to be able to come back. There was something complications with the surgery. Right. And something didn't seal up right. And Mm. it just got toxic. So, and I got to say goodbye the last time without him actually being there. And it sucks. It's hard yeah. to even tell that story, but it's important because I had spent my whole life up to that moment, mm-hmm. like I've been saying, going with the flow. And while doing that, I was really, I was on this plan of, I got to take care of my job. I got to get the promotions. I got to uh, save more money because that's how I'm going to get to where the point where the, the spreadsheet makes sense. Yeah. Right. And I can get the pile of money so big yeah. that it can support me for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. But my, who was my best mentor of that plan? Yeah. My dad. My dad. And I, I had just watched him and this hit me like a ton of bricks. I just watched him without getting a chance to leave what he wanted to leave mm. at 49 years old. Mm. He left it all behind. Right. Yeah. He never stopped and broke free and got to pursue something he wanted to pursue. And I'm putting wanted to pursue in quotes because he lived a great, great life. I don't mean to tell these stories and think that want people to think like, I don't think my dad was happy. He was happy. He had a great life, but he wanted, I think there's more, we got to be passionate about what we're doing every Mm. day Mm. Yeah. or it's going to wear, it's going to wear at you. I I honestly think part of me thinks that that cancer was a, a subliminal, uh, you know, he's, he's, his job is lethargic. It's sitting at a desk all day. And it's, if you're like sitting there not enjoying what you're doing all day, that's going to have some effect on your mind. Some mm. physiological, yeah. effect. you'll put in the right terms for me. <laughs> um, so man. was it because of that moment at what, what did that kind of help you begin to transition into real estate or was that a moment of decision for you? Yeah. So this is a huge turning point. Dad was a great mentor. Yeah. He trained me. He, he showed me how to be a good worker, be a good contribution to the be world. A good man. And the greatest yeah. gift he ever, yeah, be a great man. The greatest gift though, that he ever gave to me was leaving early because he taught me the value of our time. And mm, then wow. so we were, I was living wow. up to that moment thinking 
we have time, like time. There's going to be time to go. He would invite me to hunting trips with him and his buddies Mm -hmm. countless times. And I kept saying, no, I'm busy at work, dad. I've got a project going on. I've told you how important it is and how schedule deadline it is. Would the, would the project have stopped Gabe if I had gone hunting with him? Yeah. Yeah. They'd have kept going. It would, it would have kept going, but I passed on every chance to go hunting with my dad. Mm. And I will never get the chance to go hunting with my dad. Mm. So dad showed me with his last breath that he showed me, I, I, I tasted regret, real regret. Yeah, like yeah. I will never get that chance to say yeah. yes. I passed on a lot of family trips. Yeah. I passed on all these things. I should have been at a lot of them and I chose not to. I didn't think I was choosing not to, but when I look back, I was choosing not yeah, to. Yeah, that's very true. That's very, you, we choose, right? And when, you know, sometimes we say we don't have time for somebody, you know, we, we, we were too busy to respond. We chose not to respond. We chose to be busy because we have time. We, we can carve out time. Yeah. We always can. We can make the time for what's important to us. And for, it didn't happen overnight. I tell yeah. this story because it didn't happen overnight. And for two more years, I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm-hmm. Though. So I'm like rolling, battling this with, with this in my mind while yeah. I'm trying to fight through this marriage. Ultimately the marriage fails. We moved back to Portland. We're still fighting. So I finally just cut the cord and I'm okay. like, so I'm now at like the lowest of my low. I've lost my yeah. dad a year or so prior. Yeah. Now I'm getting divorced mm. and I'm feeling beat and yeah. I'm working my job still, still in engineering. And, but now because and I'm starting to, I'm trying to pull it apart and understand why this bugs me so much yeah. because it could just be, Hey, you lost your dad. That's what anyone mm. on the outside mm. might okay. look. But what was going on deeper is I was so, I had seen dad feeling the same ways I was feeling after just seven years of this yeah. job. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, something's wrong here. So I started that is the turning point, Gabe. Like you asked me, yeah. this was the turning point where I started to think, what else could I be doing? Mm. And after eight years of leaving school, I finally, finally opened another book to read it, to try to learn something mm. like a book, not related to engineering and yeah. just finding the answer to this engineering problem. And right. so I start <laughs> for the first time I pick up a book and I start, I started with finance. Like how do I take a dollar? Mm-hmm. Cause my spreadsheet doesn't work right now. If, if I stick with what I'm doing, it's going to take me 30 years, 40 mm, years to right. get there. Gotcha. To that freedom. Right. Right. And after. And so I start with finance. I learn, I, I start reading all these books on finance, what to do with a dollar, what to take, how do I take $1 and turn it into $2? Mm. Sounds simple, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But it's not, it's, it's not, not that, uh, we're not taught that at school. Yeah. So I go on the journey to learn that I actually start uh, learning finance mm-hmm. and, and, the first endeavor into something beyond engineering was I, I, uh, I wanted, I, what I was learning was so valuable, save money, have it grow. Mm -hmm. I started trying to, I started selling financial products, Mm -hmm. uh, or attempting to, which Mm -hmm. was the first endeavor into any kind of sales at all. Right. And, and it, and this is the side hustle mid moonlighting hours. Yeah. Cause you're still working your job. Um, but the stuff was valuable and I yeah. got, I got excited about it. I was like, people need to know this. So I, it was the first taste of trying to sell something and mm. I, without really selling something. Cause it's valuable to them. Right. Anything right. we're selling should be equal or more valuable than the price it costs, because it, that's the only way people are going to part with their money for yeah, it. Makes sense. So that was the first j- journey into sales. Mm. And it was, it was super uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, because I'm the engineer, right? Yeah. I'm like the math guy. Not sales the, is different. Not you got to be a bit of an extrovert. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You got to pick up the phone and call somebody. Yeah. They're, cold calling, baby. Got to pick that? up that phone. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I'm like sweating just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's talking, that's, that's my bread and butter right there. Oh man. It is mine too now, but five years, six years ago, me, it was like, you could rip my finger off. I'd rather have that. Yeah. Than cold yeah. Call this person. So Long story short, I sold one financial thing ever, but the more important thing is I kept reading the books Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, and I kept trying to learn more. And finally, after learning all this finance and a lot of which I learned, I figured out, I I had learned a shitload of it at engineering school. They have actual engineering, uh, finance for engineers, because we got to know a lot about, should I buy this bulldozer or not Mm, and how to depreciate it and what would it be worth 30 years from now or whatever. Depreciation is your friend. (laughs) Depreciation and future (laughs) value of present value of money, future value of money, all yeah. those things add up. All and that I, fun stuff. I, <laughs> it sounds, it probably sounds like a nightmare to a lot of people <laughs> listening, but finance is huge. Yeah. There's 
trillion dollar industry is just yep. in, the, in yep. the business of taking money and lending it and moving yeah. it and, and buying different assets with it. So mm-hmm. got a little taste of that and kept learning. And an amazing thing happened. <laughs> I walked again into realizing that in 2013, I was back in Oregon and I bought a house. Mm. I didn't put any thought into it in terms of an investment or doing it any more on purpose than I needed a place to live. Mm. And it was in our hometown in Mount Angel. And it, this is how much thought I put into it. Well, feels like the market has stopped tanking yeah, and it's flattened out. This is 2013. Right. And sure enough, I, I hadn't, I wasn't an economist by any means. I was just looking around, right. spent maybe two months thinking about it and then bought one. Mm-hmm. And got roommates right away because I like living with roommates. I like mm-hmm. the flexibility and the ability to save money and bought the house in 2013. This journey of finance was up here in 2016. So now I'm looking, I've learned all this stuff about finance. Mm-hmm. I look at that house and I'm like, that house right there. What if I put that into my spreadsheet? How's that looking? Put in what I put down for that house was about 15,000 mm-hmm. bucks, paid 200 K roughly. And then I looked today after what I'd learned that, if I'd sold, if I sold that house game, it was worth two fifty. Mm. meaning my 15 grand became 50,000. Right. Right. And when yeah. I look at that ROI or that investment, right. I'm like, Hey, finance friends, how come we're not talking about this? Cause this is yeah. like, this yeah. is like three X and three. Yeah. Years. Real estate's different. And I didn't even try to do that. Yeah. And they're all, they, when I ask them that, cause that was a serious question I asked, they're like, Oh, Bob, real estate's risky. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, you know, millions are made and millions are lost. Yes, it's very true. You got to have money to make money. Right, right. And 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 they're right. There's a lot of risk, but yeah. there's risk in everything we do. Yeah, there's risk in everything. There's risk in everything we do. And I, but I, but I, having learned the fundamentals and then looking at this thing that I owned mm-hmm. and seeing like, holy cow, that more importantly, learning to actually run the numbers. Mm. So there's a smart, like. It's not even smart. It's just simple math to say, should I buy this rental property? Right. Is it a good idea? Just break it down. What's the income potential if you do your study, the rent, and then take out every expense you're going to pay for it every single month, mm. taxes, insurance, maintenance, vacancy, managing it, replacing the roof someday, have those holdbacks built in there. Mm. And if you on a monthly basis, just break that down and see if there's any, can it break even or make maybe net a profit at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. It's a simple equation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I learned that equation and I went, wow, that's pretty simple. But this house I bought doesn't meet this rule, meaning it's taking me backwards on a monthly basis. Gotcha. It won't gotcha. rent to cover all those expenses. Gotcha. Right? Yep. But, but the value had gone up. So I mm. saw, well, shoot, I need to sell this thing. I, I was able to, connect real estate to finance and simple math. Right. And it made my decision-making way easier. So it's almost like you're doing engineering, but in real estate. Yeah. Real estate and finance is really simple engineering. So what was, what was the the hardest part of your transition from engineering to real estate and to being an investor? And then more importantly, what, what, what do you currently enjoy about it? So that realization helped me go, oh my gosh, I need to do this on purpose, mm. right? I'm still working engineering, but this house that I bought on accident, not right. on accident, I purposely yeah, bought it, right. but not as an investment. Right, right. Here I am looking for what else could I do that gives me freedom in my life uh, sooner than 30 years from now. And this kind of comes from all the things that I'm learning. Yeah. Finance coupled with real estate, because it's right there. It's a mm-hmm. house. I can see yeah, it. It's I can, tangible. I can pretty easily see what it's going to rent for. Yep. It, the, the the stars aligned that I yeah. was able to connect the dots and go, holy crap, I need to go try to buy these houses on purpose. Mm-hmm. And so I did. <laughs> <laughs> I started searching. I started watching the inner, started watching Zillow, Craigslist, mm. anywhere you could think about uh, talking with, trying to network with people, mm-hmm. talking to my friends and family yeah. so much so that they told me to shut the hell up. Like, <laughs> we don't want to hear about how you're going to go buy houses. And I said, great, that's fine. But sure enough, I'm still working my full-time job and just because I'm studying and and persisting at this and and watching the market, seeing what values are, an opportunity comes up to buy a house a couple doors down from my -hmm. my best friend's house. Uh, He knows I'm searching and I want to buy. So he says, hey, they say they're selling. Yep. And I walked over there, walked through the property. They told me what they want for it. And I said, let's do the deal. And that was the first one I bought on purpose Mm. while still working the full-time job. And that, that turned out to be a great opportunity right. for them. They didn't have to put it on the market, clean it up. It was literally 
seventies and it had never been updated. Oh, yeah. Plumbing was leaking. Oh, the roof yeah. needed done. And I was able to look at it and go, okay, I saw that in this area, houses like this are selling for this amount of money. Right, They're asking right. me for this amount of money. I've got to put, I got to estimate a repair. Okay. We can do that. How much does it need? And I said, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And all of a sudden now I'm buying a house on purpose. Right. That actually brings me forward towards freedom. Mm in my spare time. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that happens. And then I get around the right people while this is going on. I start networking mm. just like you're, you're We've been talking up. about so important on the show. We've been talking about the importance of networking. Yeah. It's just it, so important. It is. And if you purposely decide who you need to find and be around and then you go seek them out, you can't mm. just knock on their door and expect them to give them, give you all your time, all their time. Right. But, right. But there's people out there that are actively putting themselves in front of crowds and trying to meet more people. Yep, so I yep. go out in Portland into the investor world and meet the right people. Mm. And I, more importantly, I find the right of the right people. Like the, the ones that I think are doing, they seem smarter. They seem like they're doing something a little different than everyone mm, else. Yeah, and I yeah, say, those you, innovators. I want to know what you yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. And I actually paid them as mentors to tell me what I need to know. Cause I didn't, yeah. I just learned the value of time. Right. My dad just taught me that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want this journey to take 10 years to figure this mm, out. Yeah. I said, I want to know what, you know, can I hire you to be my coach? Right. And right. they said, yeah, let's do it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what, what was the, what was the hardest part? So now you, we're kind of talking about, you know, networking, finding your, your way throughout, but what was the difficult part from transitioning from engineering to real estate? The hardest part is undeniably right between our, t our own two ears. Mm. It's a mindset. Mm. When I was at my job and trying to break free, because uh -huh. now after dad passed, I yeah. spent two years there, mm. but I was not the fire in my belly for doing this task mm. was gone. I showed up out of obligation and cause I needed to get a paycheck, mm. pay bills. Gotcha. The fire was out. Yeah. So, yeah. but I didn't think I could leave because I need my, expenses covered, right? right? We all do. Right. So it was my mind keeping me there thinking mm, that way. Wow. Instead, what happened was I learned from these mentors. They told me like, Hey, you need to go be proactive about this and get your own phone to ring. Mm. Or you need to make those cold calls that you're so scared yeah. of. You yeah. need to get the opportunities coming to you to help people solve their problems, bring value to them. Cause in turn, if you solve somebody's big problem, there's usually some kind of compensation related to that. Yeah, yeah that's and a good point. Especially if you make sure you're solving the problem. Like we wouldn't buy something that takes us backwards if we're being careful about it, right? right if we're right. running the numbers, doing our due diligence. Mm. That's the game. That's what yeah. I learned from them. And so they got me to switch to flip the switch to don't just look for the opportunities, make go find the opportunity. Mm, yes. Yes. So I started hitting the phone, started sending out direct mail and got another opportunity to buy a duplex, which uh, turned out to be a great solution for the, the owner of that property. And now I've had two, two big wins while yeah. I'm still working my full-time job. And I'm like, okay, finally, because I stuck around with those, those people playing a bigger game than me taught, you know, they lived in that arena, right? Not ha they didn't have a job. Right. So I'm looking at them, doing what they're doing. Yeah. Like, Sole proprietors. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, finally it clicked. Like I could do that too. As yeah. long as I go work my ass off. Right. And I make sure I plant enough seeds every day that the harvest comes. Mm. Yeah. And finally one, uh, you know, it took two years to get to that moment, but finally it clicked. And that's mm. the hardest part from leaving my W2 biweekly salary. Yeah. Yeah. That more than pays my bills to going the next, I, as soon as that that switch flipped, by the way, it was, it, it flipped so hard when I thought, and this is a phrase that kind of sticks in my head is like, it's as simple as I thought it might be. Mm. I asked a friend of mine who didn't have a job. Like if I just, her name's Lindy. I'm like, Lindy, if I just go knock on every door and yeah. make calls until I get the, get the deal. Yeah. Is that as simple as it is? Yeah, it, it truly is. It, it really is about <laughs> persistence, right? Yeah. Sales. And, you know, I think you, you mentioned some of the things, um, talking about how you were never a salesperson, right? But it was something that you grew and you learned and now you're very good at it, right? Well, I, or I, good I, can be a, yeah, I however mean, you I want to define. I think it's more of communication, mm, right? Like mm. I was scared to communicate with people. Mm. I mean, some of the best, I met uh, some really good communicators and they actually frightened me when I was, because I knew they were so much better at it than I was. Mm. 
And I think sales is just being able to communicate with people and listen and understand yes. what their problem is. And can I offer you a solution that solves it? Yep. If they tell me they have a problem that I can't solve well for them, I'm not even going to offer them a solution yeah. because it, it's not what you told me you need. Yep. Yep. See, and that's, that's my role too. You know, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. I build relationships. Yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not here to sell you on anything. I'm here to identify your needs and address those. Yeah. And if I can't identify your needs, that's okay too. I'll be here if you need me. Yeah. Actually, I, I can't help you with this, but you know what, Gabe, Gabe, you should talk to him. He yep, exactly. You manage up, to Gabe. manage he, up. He knows exactly what you need. Call Gabe. It's so important to manage up to, you know, manage up yourself, manage up your colleagues, manage up your network. Refer, you know, like meet people that do, that do provide the value yep. that you know yeah. your clients are going to need. Yeah. And once that flip switched, it was the next day I was in my manager's office and I said, I'm sorry. Here's my two week notice. Mm. I'm going to go buy real estate or do some business around real estate. Right, right. It's not because I love houses. Right. It's because this business is so broad. Oop. This business is so broad. You can, you can help people in any which way right. you can help investors. You can help home buyers. You yeah. can help sellers. You can help manage property rentals. Yeah. It, it's, it's huge. And yeah. finally that, that realization, like if I just go work and plant enough seeds until the harvest comes. I'll mm. be all right. We'll figure it out. Mm. It was a mindset shift that needed to happen. So, so looking back on it all, right. You, you, you come all this way. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give your younger self? Well, I would, <laughs> my younger self would need to know that a, you don't know everything. Mm. Yep. You don't, you yep. might be wrong about what you think, you know, Mm. And more importantly, like we don't, time is not guaranteed Mm. that, that that's the lesson that I want other people to realize. And especially past me, but past me, here's, here's what I'm doing now, Gabe. It's, we've got to get really good at sharing these stories, sharing these ideas, because at the time I wouldn't have heard it. Even if I showed up in front of myself and said, Hey, listen to me, I wouldn't have listened. Mm. I wasn't ready to hear it. Yeah. So at some point I'm going to say my story and the right person is going to be in the right frame of mind at that right moment. Mm. And it's going to click for them. Yeah. And that's why we have to keep doing it yeah. because there's a lot of people out there. And this is why coming, bringing it full circle, why business is the way it is or what yeah. I'm doing right now is the why behind it is there's a whole bunch of other me's. I was mm. one of them mm. that feel stuck. Yeah. They're not happy. Yeah. The cancer is growing. Mm. And they don't yeah. know what else they could be doing. They, yeah. they feel like you go to school for this for your whole freaking life. Yeah. You pay thousands of dollars for this degree and then you go get that job. And how can you in your mind after all of that justify leaving it? Mm. Yeah. Great, great, great points. You know, before, before we leave here, how somebody's listening at home, they want to utilize your services. Yeah. How, how do they contact box real estate? Yeah. So box real estate is my brokerage. Uh, It's a group of amazing brokers. I have to pinch myself. I'm so grateful for every single one of them. There's incredible people there. And the best way to reach me is to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Bob Boxler. You'll see my name in Gabe's, uh, at Gabe's podcast and the summary. Uh, Instagram is probably the best place that I'm most active. Real Bob, real Bobby B. Um, real Bobby B (laughs) real Bobby B box real estate though, is the brokerage. We do an amazing job of selling houses, buyers and sellers, helping people buy houses. We're great negotiators. We've got a great group of individuals and all of them have an abundance mindset. A we're going to do the very best possible job we can Mm -hmm. for anyone who calls on us. Mm -hmm. Uh, box real estate. I'm also working to grow it because as we just mentioned, the the why behind we we all have to have a why, right, Gabe? Right. Like right. if your job if your why is just to make money, you're gonna make some money and then what? Yeah. So my my why is to help other me's break free. Mm. Also help other me's and my brokers. We are, we all want to buy buy real estate because right. that's our freedom plan. Yeah. And and those everything we buy or figure out how to buy and make it pencil. Because yeah. there's something we can 
learn about the property, something we can learn about the zoning code, something we can do to that property to make it cash flow or yeah. be a be a big step forward in equity, right? We we talk about those every single week and we're pushing each other. Every yeah. single one of us is trying to level up our game. Yeah. So that is really we want to grow the brokerage. My vision yeah. is to grow brokerage to we're at 19 brokers now. We're going to grow it to 200. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And we're going to be in multiple locations right wow. now. Portland is home base. Yeah. But we're going to grow this and I love it, it. It's the abundance mindset, man. Yeah. It's, and more importantly, it's the urgency of life. Yeah. Helping yeah. spread the word. We're like, on a time. Yeah. I think entrepreneurs and the, the subject of this podcast is amazing. Uh, and thank you for creating it. You're inspiring yeah. me to create mine. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming on again. Yeah. It, and so we, they, I guess entrepreneurs live in the constant urgency situation yeah. and they take life seriously because they have to, yeah. they have to wake up every day and go find people to serve so that they can put food on the table. That's and very true. Invest more into our communities. And so I want to help others break Man. free and do the same. Bob. Wow. Thank you again so very much for those listening at home. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.